Welcome back to another edition of the Edge Podcast. Publisher Brendan Slaughter here for BeaversEdge.com, joined by my co-host and KEJO radio host, TJ Matthewson, also writes for us and uh, covers practices here at BeaversEdge.com. We're back here with another edition of the podcast following Oregon State's 42 to 9 win over Colorado. The Beavers smashed the Buffaloes all up and down Reeser Stadium as they entered their bye week this week as we come to you guys with a uh, 6 and 2 and 3 and 2 record overall uh, in the Pac 12. Again, Brennan Slaughter joined by TJ Matthewson. Welcome back to the pod, TJ. We're not quite the halfway point as Oregon State has, you know, played eight games, but let's just call it the unofficial halfway point since we're at the bye. It's a good good time for the bye week. The uh, the change in weather has really taken a toll on <laughs> on me. I've been sick for the last I think five days. TJ uh, playing hurt. Not Jordan been enjoyable. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. It is not a. It has not been enjoyable uh, these last few days. So I'm, I'm glad we can at least take this week to to recuperate a little bit. Me and you both there at Reeser on Saturday. Right. Uh, a lot of what we expected out of this game, Brendan. I mean, the first half wasn't perfect by any means. 21 to right. uh, 21 to three at the half. We were like, well, if we're looking on pace, probably, you know, uh, as someone who predicted a 31 to 10 final, I said, wow, that was setting up nicely uh, for yeah. the, the Beavs to kind of just wind down the second half. They added on quite a bit more. And actually looked a lot better in the second half, a lot more explosive um, and a lot more complete in the second half. The defense got a touchdown. The offense was rolling through the air and on the ground. Jack Velling, 60-yard right. touchdown. Longest reception by an Oregon State tight end since 1999. Yeah, um, nice little nugget there so coming from the Oregon State pretty good. communication yep. staff. Love it. Love yep. it. Yeah, it was pretty good by a true freshman, too, that yeah. you know, who's found himself wide open right in the middle of the field. Uh Ben Goldbranson had a really nice day throwing the ball. I thought, you know, he's not – it's not at the point of his career where he's going to drop back 55 times and throw for 400 yards. Right. But in that game against a defense that is pretty bad, he hung there in the pocket, sometimes against pressure, sometimes not because Colorado doesn't really pressure the quarterback. Right. Um, and from the pocket, made some really nice throws. And it clearly right. that one was his best one of the day. Uh, you know, just kind of a loft over the middle to Jack Velling and – Belling showing some really nice after the catch uh, explosiveness there to break some tackles and get his way all the way into the end zone. And as weeks go by, that you know hole that Luke Musgrave left is as you know valuable as he is seems to just get smaller and smaller as the weeks go. Right, on. right. And I think I think you know speaking to Jack Belling, you know that you know he he really has come on you know the last couple of weeks and and you know perhaps. You know, it's just a matter of opportunity. Perhaps it really is just like a next man up. I mean, like you said, no one is Luke Musgrave, but you got to give credit, you know, to Jack Belling and even to an extent, Jake Overman, who's made a few catches and done really well as a blocker, uh, you know, kind of uh, filling in that role too, which is kind of the unsung (laughs) hero role. Um, I I give him a lot of credit for that too. So, and the thing that, you know, also is worth mentioning in that game that I thought was just standout, TJ, is Damian Martinez, you know, almost 200 yards on the ground, three touchdowns, um, you know, Deshaun Fenwick, Jonathan Smith said post game was a little banged up. They decided to kind of keep him in an emergency role and just roll with, uh, you know, the combination of Martinez, Jam Griffin, and then to an extent, uh, Isaiah Newell and Kanoa Shannon as the game went along. But man, we've gone back and forth. There's been times when jams look like the guy, but lately it seems like it's been Damien and it seems like he's coming on really strong. I think he's, you know, I did a story um, uh, by the numbers. Check it out at beaversedge.com uh, uh, yesterday. And I believe, uh, remembering correctly, Martinez is like third in the Pac-12 in yards per rush. Extremely efficient. And, mm-hmm. you know, really, TJ, anchored now by a lead guy of Martinez. Oregon State's got three backs that have proven to be productive this year. I think Jam hasn't quite gone over 100 yards, but he's been close. Fenwick has. And Martinez is playing his best football right now. Yeah, we're, I guess, looking at per rush, I'd say it's probably pretty hard outside of maybe those really top dogs to find running right. backs that have run as efficiently uh, as Oregon State's. And uh, I'm glad to see Damian really sort of catch on like this. So yeah. I think people kind of forget at the beginning of the year and all this camp hype that we're loading on him and we whisper in the – in our in our <laughs> practice reports, oh, Damian Martinez, seventy five yard touchdown. Oh, it was a daily. It was a daily right. It was a daily. It was right like, ooh, TJ's... Damian looked nice and yep. explosive today, and yep. Yep. you know, people get very excited over that. Yep. And it's like, okay, game start. I mean, 
He's a he's a true freshman. Sometimes it takes a little while to catch on. Right. And I guess it did, right? And maybe it was just from the fact of he was a facing a very terrible run defense and be. Uh, B, he's, you know, he's finally comfortable, right? He's attacking the hole. I think we saw a little bit of this real breakout against Stanford. Um, and now truly again, facing Colorado, a bad rush defense, like, okay, we're just Damien, Damien will be the lead guy today. And then jam sort of a change of pace back, which that's how he was featured against Colorado, really just a more um, when they needed sort of just a different, like some more, a little bit more just straight up burst. Then Damien, right. well, Damien sort of the, it seems like the, the all around package of burst and physicality uh, as opposed to jam Griffin. I, we're still not going to see him be the just true number one guy. That will not happen. Uh, yeah. We, we, it, Jonathan's going to get asked probably within the first five questions on Monday. Uh, if Damien Martinez will take the majority of the reps and he's going to say, Nope, we like all three of our guys. Yeah. No, he was, he, he was every you know, week. Yeah, it was definitely interesting, you know, post game TJ, because obviously, you know, you're, you're you know, here in the, the lowdown from Jonathan Smith's press conference, even though you're, you're obviously getting back to the studio and whatnot. But, you know, I believe he got asked that again. It was kind of like, well, you know, we like to ride the hot hand. You know, Damien was hot tonight. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think I think it's one of those things where they know there's some talent back there and they want to keep a lot of talent happy. And maybe yeah. that's, you know, not wanting Jam Griffin or Damian Martinez to feel like, you know, as, as young guys relatively, um, you know, they need to hit the portal if they're not getting, you know, the, the amount of carries that they want, you know, things like that. So I do think it is uh, an interesting thing to navigate, especially in today's world, TJ, where it's like, mm-hmm. oh, I got five carries this week. I can transfer. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, uh-huh. it, it's this new world that, you know, college football is. And I think, you know, that, that committee right now is kind of satisfying the fact that there are maybe two, three, maybe even four running backs when you throw Trey low into the mix um, that really deserve to have the ball in their hands, you know, five plus times a game at minimum. So, yeah. you know, but you, you do that and all of a sudden you're at 20 carries between the four guys. So I think that's an interesting thing to uh, kind of mix, but you know, we saw the Beavers do it pretty well uh, against Colorado. And then to your point, <coughs> uh, Colorado just they didn't put up much of a fight, and we didn't necessarily no. expect them to. How, excuse me, how um, how impressive was it for you to see the growth of Oregon State's program? Where maybe even in years past, a game like this against an inferior opponent would have led to, you know, the Beavers letting Colorado maybe hang around for longer than they should have when, you know, you were sitting right next to me right there in the press row, and the game was in the cooler pretty quick. Yeah, it didn't take very long. I mean, you could just I, – I made sure to write down on my notes when I was watching the Oregon State defense versus the Colorado offense. I just – you could just write it down. I mean, watching Colorado, it's like, well, there's just, like, no juice there. There's nothing. There, there, there's, yeah. no, there's no heartbeat there. So, at that point, I mean, yeah. I, I kind of expected the, the defense alone to, to go ahead and win that game. But, you know, again, I'm not like this Oregon State historian, as you guys know. <laughs> yeah. I've been I've been in this area for about a year and a half now uh, learning about this. But, you know, it, 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 the question came up on our show last week between, you know, John and Mike asking, you know, when was the last time the Beavers were favored by 24 points in a conference game? Like, when was that? Do you, do yeah. you know? I, I, I don't. Regardless, not, they, they not only were favored, they easily covered. Yeah, easily. So I think um, yeah, that's a good and, and question. Just like, and you know, you, we can throw around the saying of uh, you know, good teams win, great teams cover, yada yada yada. But you, I mean, you even exceeded the Vegas like expectations of the game, right? Which is a good sign that you are you have been favored in six games this year, and you've won all six. So right. you have not had a disappointing. You've had disappointing losses, but not disappointing in the eyes of the should you win this game right no i get what you're getting at yeah yeah and and that's an interesting and good way of looking at it because you know i think sometimes you have to take a step back and you know uh, i kind of wrote about that a little bit you know post game saturday night was you know when you think and it was actually the first question i asked jonathan smith is when you look big picture tj and you know you you've been around long enough to know what it was like when jonathan smith came in here and the uphill climb that Oregon State's had to make. And that's why I asked Jonathan, I'm like, can you just kind of take a step back and, and, and revel in the fact that, you know, you're going to a bowl game for two straight years when 
you know, I can speak from personal experience. When I was at Oregon State from 2014 to 2018, uh, that notion was impossible. And, you know, then even when Jonathan Smith comes in, you know, first year, you know, it's, it's rough, right? It's basically an extension of the Gary Anderson years for the amount of legwork Jonathan Smith and his staff had to do. A little bit better in 19, they get closer, they go five and seven, but then the COVID year kind of sets everyone back and then they bounce back. And now you have two straight years of going to a bowl game. I think that just speaks to the growth of the program and the real culture that Jonathan Smith's been able to build because, you know, the Beavers are winning games. I don't think they have the most talent in the Pac-12, but they're still finding a way to be near the top. And I I think that's impressive in itself. And like you said, winning the games they were supposed to win, maybe they're still searching for that marquee win that, you know, really you stamp and go, you know, that's Mm -hmm. like the best win of the Jonathan Smith tenure. And I think that game's up for debate right now. I think there could be, you know, numerous, you know, contenders there. Um, But, you know, Jonathan Smith and his staff have talked about it, TJ, and we'll get into it here as we talk, you know, the last half and uh, bowl projections and kind of give some awards from the first half of the season. Um, But Oregon State's got four games left, and Jonathan Smith (laughs) talks about making November November, uh, meaningful, and uh, they have. TJ, because you were telling me as we're going into this, yep. everything's still in play. Everything. Yep. Oh, everything. Yep. I mean, Ro- Rose Bowl in play completely. It's, you, it's, you it's look, a chance. Yeah. It's like, it's it like, is Lloyd, a chance, Christ- yeah. it's, it is it's like Lloyd Christmas, it, right? Tell me there's would, a chance. You would. Yeah. I mean, you would need some things to happen, but it's right. not out of the question. Like the Beavers winning the Pac-12, not out of the question. There is enough cluster at the top of the conference mm-hmm. where, um, I, I don't have all the schedules in front of me. I just have the standings up. Right, but as well. There is enough. There is enough room. I know Oregon still has to play Utah. Um, still has to play Utah. USC still needs to play UCLA. So from that group alone, that means a grouping of those schools could have two losses, or Oregon would have one. Uh, right. Oregon also play still needs to play Washington this year. Yep. Um, so there's again another opportunity um for a little bit more chaos on the top again mm. so oregon still is the is the only team that doesn't have a a, a pac-12 loss this year they would for the beefs to catch them in the standings mm-hmm. for the beefs to catch them in the standings <laughs> they would need to lose two games now the beavers will have an opportunity to get one of those here yes. at research Stadium obviously with the tiebreaker and if we're talking about you know wins the jonathan smith tenure i think beating this year's oregon team would very very much uh, be up there because that oregon team went uh, in the second half, really just kind of whipped UCLA around down there at uh, right. Austin Stadium right. on Saturday. No. Yeah. So it would be it would be you know I I kind of threw it around on the on the um, the Collins show after the game that you know I I kind of forgot about Ohio State Michigan, but I'll say besides that, I mean I wouldn't think if Oregon State wins out and Oregon wins out going into that game that that wouldn't be game day um, right. between the, those two schools and. You know, if you think about that way, so if Oregon goes undefeated the rest of the way, they knock Utah, um, they knock Utah down to two losses. USC and UCLA, one of them would have two losses. Um, and there'd be some some tour of tiebreaker scenarios, but Oregon State would still only have two losses in conference right. uh, when it gets to that point. So, I mean, again, you you start doing the if and buts, and you know, might require a little bit more math, but you know, the opportunities are there um, for you know setting up a really exciting matchup there at the end of the year. Yeah, no doubt. You know, you know, all bets are always off in that game. And I think that's that's going to be, you know, I think this is shaping up to be, you know, the biggest civil war in, you know, at least 10 years, if not maybe more, you know, potentially going back to 2009 when there was, you know, a birth in the Rose Bowl on the line in that game. And, you know, it's it, it's going to be interesting, too, because, you know, Oregon's been really, really good this year. And I don't think anyone can deny that outside of that Georgia game. But with what Oregon State's strength is this year, TJ, which is a secondary that is very physical and deep. Yep. Which means, you know, I I just – I think, you know, Oregon State's run defense vastly improved. But I think the X factor for a team beating Oregon is having a secondary that can kind of go toe-to-toe when Bo Nix is on. And I think Oregon State can do that. So I I really give Oregon State a a, a fighter's chance, maybe even more in that game. But – yeah, TJ and I will obviously be getting into that game as the week goes <coughs> on, but but, yeah. but he but he's right, you know. There's there's, there's and most a lot importantly, of that game being played at Reeser Stadium, which again the Beaver yeah. defense plays just at a different level at that at that stadium. Well, and you know, 
case in point, uh, the Beavers won the last matchup in Reeser. I know there were no fans in 2020, but Oregon State, yep. you know, defeated the, you know, the Mario Cristobal and boys in Reeser Stadium in 2020. So, you know, th- there are members on this team that knows what it's like to beat Oregon. So there's that confidence there. There's the belief there. And, you know, I think that's going to be a dandy of a game, you know, at the end of the season. But with four more to go, TJ, I'm kind of curious just to get your thoughts. We'll get into bowl projections and kind of talk about that a little bit here in a minute. But I want to get uh, some of your kind of awards so far from the season. Uh, let's let's talk a little offensive, maybe defensive. We don't have to go MVP, but just guys that you're uh, particularly impressed with. And then, uh, you know, any other kind of things you want, want to throw out there. Just for me first, I, I think um, I think my offensive MVP is going to kind of be shared by the entire backfield slash the offensive line and that's cheating but i Uh think uh (laughs) you know i i I think you know just again by the story that i did earlier this week the by the numbers on beaver's edge it really shows that oregon state's success as an offensive unit is entirely tied to their running game especially once chance nolan has gone out like if oregon state doesn't have a running game i don't think they win these last three games and i don't mean to say that to be dramatic but like Oregon State has not really been able to pass the ball all that particularly well since, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, Chance Nolan left. There's been some some moments and some flashes, but it just hasn't been, you know, big numbers or anything like that. You know, uh, Treshawn Harrison's numbers are down a little bit. Uh, Anthony Gould's numbers are down a little bit, you know. So I think, um, you know, that part is maybe the part of the offense that I'd like to see that's been a little bit of a disappointment and partially, you know, based on the injury, you know, before Chance Nolan got hurt the passing offense was showing, you know, two, 300 yards passing per game with Ben. It's been a little closer to the ones, maybe fish cracking two. Um, so I think on offense, that's what Oregon state's got to be looking for, but I've been super impressed uh, with the running game uh, and the offensive line, which, you know, with the talent uh, on both sides there, that's definitely nothing to scoff at. And then uh, defensively, I, I think you got to give it to the secondary uh, just, just, for how well they've been able to play. I think there's a lot of leadership back there. Um, I think linebacker play has been good too, and defensive line play has obviously been improved, but I- I've just been particularly impressed with the secondary. You know, Oladapo, Grant, Austin, uh, Ryan Cooper has been an awesome new addition. Um, uh, I-, I know I'm spacing on someone back there, TJ. Uh, um, uh, help me out. Uh, who else is, is – oh, Rajon Wright. Rajon Wright. Yeah, there we go. And, um, you know, th- that, that group's just been particularly impressive. So I think, mm-hmm. I think I've liked what I've seen from them. And I think the secondary has been a big reason that why the defense has been successful. Yeah. So I'll agree with you on defense, um, secondary, uh, the best unit on the team, I think yeah. overall, it, 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 and even the depth wise too, I think uh, them, they the, are deep. Backs, I, the, the, the two really sort of deep groups out there, but they've been injury free as well. They've been very Good healthy. Point. Um, and when they've really and when they have thrived the most from this home crowd, they really do. They they can the the uh, the ability to just kind of line you know Rajon and Alex Austin up you know one on one on some of these receivers and just right. let them do their thing and sort of limit some of the best guys in the country. It's true, uh, Jordan um, Addison at, at Research Day. Yeah, Jordan Addison really didn't do anything to his final touchdown. Right, right? and Caleb and, and Caleb Williams couldn't find anything open in that USC game. Exactly. And you know the Colorado yeah. offense had all like almost nothing really going yeah. anywhere down the field uh, and the defense scored as many touchdowns as the Colorado offense did uh, on the offensive side. I would probably just give it to the offensive line. The running game is usually a direct result of the For offensive sure. line's performance. They've been among the best, you know, with the running backs behind them in yards per carry, as you mentioned, also among the, uh, the leaders nationally in sacks allowed, which is very right. important and helpful for a young quarterback like Ben Goldbranson to, you know, be able to sit in the pocket and really just focus looking down the field instead of focusing on the rushers around them. Um, this offensive line, second consecutive year, just a phenomenal group um, and one of the best nationally to really yeah. help drive this offense. You really can only go as far as your line play will take you uh, in football, yeah. really at all levels. Um, and that, or this Oregon state team on both sides, whether the pass rush is quite there on the defense or not, the run defense has been good on that line as well. Uh, and really just kind of allows Oregon state to operate how they want. Yeah, you know, Coach M up there, uh, coach that offensive line, you know, TJ, not every not every position group, you know, um, was pretty when Jonathan Smith came in. But I got to credit Coach M 
ever since day one that he came in with this program, even in 2018 when the Beavers won two games, Jamar Jefferson was a freshman All-American. Like the ability that he's had to yield an offensive line of five guys that is productive, um, severely underrated. And, and I think it's a huge, huge asset for the Beavers to have because typically you're not getting, you know, the big – blue chip five-star offensive linemen, uh, you know, that are coming to Oregon state. You have to bring in guys that you mold, you know, you're bringing up through a little bit of the time in the system and, you know, hoping that by the time they're juniors and seniors or perhaps even, you know, uh, eligible sophomores or whatnot have been in the strength program and you've kind of built them up. So I give, and they've also been active in the transfer portal as well with that adding, you know, a guy like Hanelli Bloomfield as well. Um, So I, I, I definitely agree with you. That's That's been a good position group. All this in, like, while your home base where your school is located uh, in the area with probably the least per capita of of high school, uh, of of D1-ready high school offensive linemen, probably. Yeah. I would, I would, I'd, I would pretty confidently I'd be, say that. I'd be, willing to, I'd be willing to take that bet. I mean – yeah. I, I, what are you saying, TJ? There aren't a lot of big guys on the West Coast. <laughs> no, no. Just go look at just go look at the recruiting rankings and look where oh, they are. Goodness, goodness. We, we've spent we have spent you know whole segments talking about this very issue of how just on the West Coast there's really just there's not that many offensive linemen. I that's fair. I, no. Last you got to grow I mean, last spring, Last spring on the show, we um, I I think I went and I would dove into some numbers and I looked. Uh, and I think the number last year out of last year's recruiting class, uh, four blue chip is a four or five star lineman. Uh, I looked at all of them. Uh, there are 41 blue chip linemen. There were four of them in the Pac-12 footprint out of 41. Wow. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, it just it. it I what, what can it. we say that there's not as many big guys out here? There's not. Yeah, that's an that's interesting. And and you know it's mm-hmm. it, again credit to. Jim Mahalchik, who's put, you know, um, help put Blake Brandle in, in, in the NFL. And, you know, um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, the Beavers have had, you know, a, just a lot of success, you know, putting, you know, a, a good unit together and kind of, you know, putting a, a group together that not only run block, but pass block. So I would definitely agree with that, too. Is there any area, TJ, that you're looking for improvement on either side of the ball heading into the second half that you're like, this needs to get better for Oregon State to get to where they are? Or where they I'm going to skip be, over the. Say. I'm going to skip over the obvious one in the passing game and go right to the kicking game. Oh wow, that, yeah, that's a good one. It's going to lose. It's going to lose the Beavers a game if if Atticus Sappington will if he if he str- continues to struggle outside of what 30 yards is where I yeah. think he's been comfortable this year. But he any time outside of 40 yards, I mean, I think he's hitting at about a 50 percent clip. Which yeah, you know, you would qualify Beavers that last. in Division One football. You would qualify that in Division One football as um, as makeable field goals, right? Probably within within four, forty to forty nine yards. That is sure. makeable. Um, and I every time Sappington will kick from that distance, it's uh, I, yeah. It, I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't yeah. seem like it's not something you can rely upon. And maybe the Beavers are going to need a field goal at some crucial point, and it could let them down. And yeah, the good I, I news. Think that, the kicking yeah. game is, you know, as much as people like to trash on kickers, like, oh, your job's so easy. And if they miss yeah. a field goal, it's like, oh, well, good thing kickers are so replaceable. Well, this yeah. isn't the NFL where you can just go sign a guy off of waivers who's sitting on the street and ready to kick. <laughs> yeah. You got yeah. your guys in the program um, yeah. and they need Everett. They need Everett Hayes back because otherwise I think it's going to cost them a game. Yeah, I, I would I would tend to agree. I think that's a bold and honestly a really smart prediction that I didn't see coming out is because I think the Beavers do need to tighten up that area because going back to that number story I've been referencing, TJ, Beavers are dead last in the Pac-12 in field goal percentage. Last. There aren't a lot of categories, folks, that Oregon State is last in. This program has grown leaps and bounds. You go look at any statistic, uh, you know, in that metric, you know, other than some passing numbers that have dipped down slightly, but I attribute that to Chance Nolan not being in. Everything is upper half of the Pac-12. Then you look at field goal, and it's an ugly last place. The percentage is not great. I want to say Oregon State's converted 58% of their kicks this year. Um, you know, I don't have that number right in front of me, but, um, you know, like you said, not to say that Atticus Sampington can't eventually be that guy, but right now from from distance, it's just not looking – super comfortable. And I do think, you know, Everett Hayes needs to be back. 
The good news, you know, with that, TJ, is that he was really close this last game against Colorado. Jonathan Smith had actually said post game that he was going to um, uh, come out, or I believe, I can't remember the exact verbiage from Jonathan, but that he had either gone out for warm ups, was close, and they decided to hold him, or gone out for warm ups and felt a little more tightness and shut him down. Uh, you know, been dealing with that groin issue, but with the bye week and then go and have another week to get up for Washington, I would be like, you know, just to check in on a few guys. As we sit here, you know, uh, just over nine days from that game, as that game's on a Friday, I would be shocked if Chance Nolan and Everett Hayes are not playing in that game. I would, I would be too. Uh, so, cause we but can go back to the, happen, we can go right? back to the other issue is, they need. They're going to need Chance Nolan back. But they're, yeah, uh, I think uh, we, the, we have to talk about it. Yeah, I will. Yes. I will say this same take next week when we record. I don't think the Beavers are going to win um, up in Seattle if Chance Nolan's not starting. Yeah, I don't think they will. No, I mean, I, I think I think we've made it pretty clear. I mean, you know, it's like Chance Nolan is. You know, you know, I, I've I've laid out why I think he should still be the starter. Everyone's obviously entitled to their opinion, and we have you know a lot of opinions on BeaversEdge.com. Make sure to subscribe and share yours. But um, you know, it's it's definitely been interesting to kind of see because you've had a guy in Ben Gorbranson now who has led your team to a three and zero record. But it's quite clear to me that you know he's got a lot of room to make in terms of growth as a passer, both his pocket awareness, mobility, uh, reading the pressure, going through progressions. And I'm not saying Nolan's perfect at that, but you and I, I actually talked about it a little bit uh, at Reeser Stadium, you know, during the game against Colorado. And I say again, of those eight inter or excuse me, six interceptions that Chance Nolan had in boom, boom, boom order between USC and Utah, everyone wants to look and go, all those interceptions, all those interceptions. Just for the sake of argument, cut him a little mm-hmm. slack and let's see how many of those are actually on him. And you and I talked and we're saying, Maybe four of the six, maybe, maybe, you know, right. So maybe it's closer to 50%. Um, you know, I, I get it. The interceptions were rough. The Beavers had turnovers and bunches in two games that were, you know, really good, but maybe those two teams are just really good. So, you know, as far as the analytics, the metrics, the ability to, you know, have a 300 yard passing game respectfully. Um, I, I, I think if he's healthy, there's no question. Chance Nolan's your guy. I think you have two guys you can maybe win with. And I think Ben Goldbrinson's a nice backup if something happens to Chance and can execute the offense. But I just, you know, reiterate, I think there's just a higher ceiling, TJ. Yeah. And I think the biggest key for next week's game is what we'll dive into a little more. But the Husky defense overall is actually pretty decent, right? In terms of, I think they're third yeah. in the conference in yards allowed. And Oregon State is second for comparison. Where they really uh, struggled is giving up explosive plays. And if there's one thing that we've the, the offense really has kind of been lacking uh, without Chance Nolan is those explosive passes right. down the field. Um, where Chance, you know, he's you no know, minus the ball a, minus the a other, hail mary, he's, of course, minus a hail mary, of yeah. course. <laughs> he's 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 thrown um, you know, he's thrown the ball to the other team once or twice, aiming down the field, but. Um, Pretty much, he's been pretty good throwing the ball down the field, and that, that's that been one of his better traits so far this year and something that they probably would want to exploit against that Husky defense, which has kind of struggled over the top. Uh, right. So that would probably be my biggest thing for Chance coming back is he's just got that sort of that, that deep ball chemistry that, they're, that, that they would want to use against the Huskies. Yeah, no, and I think that's a that's a that's a good point. You know, I, I know, you know, there's a reason, you know, right? The <laughs> offense has relatively been playing well with, you know, Ben Goldbrunson in there and you know I get it right why why break something that maybe works right and you've had a three and0 record but when you peel it back you go well you were lucky to win Stanford and I, I you know I'm not gonna say luck I, I still maintain a few players made some incredible plays that game that's why I Oregon won State game. what what one that won that game that's you mm-hmm. know call it luck call it whatever you want to call it but I think Oregon State just had some yeah. incredible players making some plays. Then you played a lot better against Washington State and Colorado, like we expected. But I think to. you. But I think you can say your defense won you the Wazoo game. I would say. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. And I they, think were, the defense, they were that, they were that good, without question. And you know, you go back to, you know, you take away, you know, some maybe chunk plays, and you know, again, this is not to say I'm not a fan of Ben Goldbrunson. I think he's done a terrific job, and you know, to be three and zero as a starter, you know, there 
could have been worse backup situation. But I think the Oregon State coaching staff also kind of circled the wagons, said, we're not going to have any more risky business out here. We're going to run the ball a lot. We're going to, you know, maybe have two or three risky throws or chunk plays a game as opposed to maybe double that with Chance Nolan. And I think right. the offense has just been kind of vanilla down a little bit. And, you know, for the most part, you know, I, I just think there's a higher ceiling. So we'll see. Obviously, TJ and I will get into that game, you know, next week uh, as we kind of preview that game on the Edge podcast. And make sure to stay tuned uh, to that as well as we'll be, you know, bringing you guys coverage uh, all leading up. And then uh, we'll actually be live uh, from Seattle, uh, uh, Beaver's Edge, bringing you guys coverage. But, TJ, before we close out the podcast, let's take a look at the bowl projections. Talk about a fun note because no matter what, and no matter how the season ends, TJ, Beavers are going bowling again. I know. So uh, let's take a look at some bowl, of the quick bowl, uh, bowl eligibility with four weeks, four games still to play. It's pretty good. Oh, it's pretty, a pretty good option. Oh, it's great. And you got to figure, you know, how great it is for Oregon State just to have that continuity and have, you know, something for their fans to look forward to uh, both mm-hmm. years. Let's just go ahead and run through. Um, USA Today has the Beavers uh, in the Las Vegas Bowl uh, against Florida. Uh, a couple uh, Sun Bowl projections from uh, Bleacher Report, Athlon Sports, and Sporting News. Have an interesting first responder bowl um, from Brett McMurphy and the Action Network. Yeah, I think that's the uh, the fill. That's an ESPN filler bowl. Yeah, I think I'd that's be on very this, the slate for the conference this year. Yeah, I'd be very surprised. Like Oregon State, I don't think would win another. Like if they didn't win another game, I think that'd be the bowl they'd go to. Like that's usually reserved for like mm-hmm. the six win team. So I wouldn't take that one. Uh, unbelievable. Might be it. Might be a, a Washington State Bowl, right? Or or maybe, maybe you know I'm trying to think what team could also maybe sneak in there with six wins. But um, yeah, I think uh, you know right now to me um, the most likely it's looking like are probably going to be the Sun Bowl or Las Vegas Bowl. I saw the Holiday Bowl mentioned last week as well. Um, you know, mm-hmm. at this point, it's all just you know fun projections and fun for us to dish about. But I'm not going to lie, um, you know, it's 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 an awesome time, TJ, to be talking about having the possibility yeah. of a bowl game for a second straight year after program was on life support with that regard for, mm-hmm. you know, a, a few many years. Yeah. Where, where would you want to go, Brendan? Oh, Vegas. Hands down. Yeah. Hands down. Hands yeah. Down. And it, the Vegas matchup is very enticing because you play SEC. an SEC team. I mean, yeah, you can either, the options holiday would be here fun. are, yeah, holiday would be fun. Holiday would be best location. Yes. Vegas, I think, would be best quality of game because I think yes. so. The 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 Vegas, I think, it rotates between the Big Ten and the SEC each it year. It does. Um, yes. So like this year's the SEC, right? So I mean, uh, awesome Florida is an option. Billy Napier back, kind of near his footprint. Yeah. His former assistant at ASU should have probably hired him. Um, <laughs> Vegas, Vegas or versus LSU. Brian Kelly and his fake Southern right. accent. Uh, John Wilner didn't put his prediction in here. But it's sort of like kind of an upper mid-level SEC team. It looks like this year the Sun Bowl, an opportunity versus Mario Cristobal again oh, as Athlon Sports be projects. That'd be fun, uh, especially with Miami just has honestly been a dumpster fire this year. Yeah, so oh, that'll be that'll be kind of interesting. To, uh, yeah, Beaver fans yeah. Would, would love to pay Mario back another loss, and I'm, I'm sure Oregon no, fans. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure he be, would. And Oregon fans wouldn't I, be too disappointed either. So you know, no biggie. I've just heard. I've just heard some sort of like some dislike of going to El Paso, which I like. Yeah. It doesn't seem like the worst. Yeah. I, I, it's I, not, I feel like, like the Sun Bowl would be a pretty good experience. Not like it's not Vegas. It's not going to the holiday bowl, but it, you know, yeah. it's probably better than going to the first responders bowl. Well, as well, you know, it's interesting because the first responder bowl is in Dallas. I think it's a TCU stadium, but you know, to your, I'm going to take that point a step further, TJ. It's something that I suffered through. It's better than noble. And it's been it is. <laughs> noble, right. and it had been noble for many, many times and many, many moons. So it's fun to talk about. And again, if you want to share your thoughts, uh, make sure to check out beaversedge.com. We definitely got a conversation going, talking bowl games and all that stuff. Uh, TJ, we're going to go ahead and put a big wrap uh, on this podcast today. I want to thank you for uh, jumping on with me as always, man. We'll be talking next week to preview that Friday game up in Seattle. And it, it's going to be a dandy, man. I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, obviously – you know, all uh, all bets are off now as Oregon State's got four games left and it's going to be exciting to see how this photo finish ends. So appreciate you jumping on the pod uh, as always, man. And we'll, uh, we'll chat next week. Yeah. And ne- next week's game is going to have like a, uh, should have a really big swing on where we think the Beavers will go bowling. Cause Good if point. they go win at Washington, they'll probably be an underdog. 
um, up on the road, I would guess, maybe a touchdown. Um, they yeah. go up there and they win that game. I mean, so I think the, the bar raises a little bit for what your expectations would be. You go on the road, you beat a very good offensive team uh, with, led by one of the best quarterbacks in the country. That would be a good win. Yeah, no, it would be huge. So we'll, we'll, we'll be back to preview it all next week. Want to give a, a big shout out again to TJ for joining me on the pod. Make sure to keep it locked. Beaversedge.com will have uh, more bye week coverage coming up and then obviously leading into Washington next week. So keep it locked. Beaversedge.com. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Edge Podcast.